Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, September 17th. Today's topic, Global Literacy and Geography Resources. Our special guest is Laura Krenicki. Your show hosts are Peggy George, Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, Paula Noggle, and today Patty Ruffing is doing closed captioning for us. And I'm going to turn the mic over now to Peggy, who will introduce Laura. Hello to all of you, and welcome. We're so glad you're here. Laura has some great things in store for us today. There are so many fantastic online learning opportunities for teachers. And I try to participate in as many as I can because I get to meet and connect with awesome educators, which extends the learning far beyond the actual webinar or the conference that I'm in. Well, I have the wonderful opportunity to participate in a presentation by our special guest today, Laura Kernicki. It was a presentation at this summer's EdCamp Global. And I was so excited about what she had to share that I knew we had to invite her to come and share with us on Classroom 2.0 Live. This is a special treat because we've never had a presentation featuring geography. She's not only an inspiring educator, but she's also an avid LiveBinder user. And she has shared her excellent LiveBinder about global literacy and geography resources with us today. And you'll get a chance to explore that as we go through the session. Laura is a sixth grade teacher at William J. Johnston Middle School in Colchester, Connecticut. And she's also an adjunct graduate instructor at Eastern Connecticut State University in Early Childhood Social Studies. I love that because it's so important to get kids started young with that. And the University of New Haven, where um, she teaches global literacy in the 21st century, as well as elementary science and social studies. She's a National Geographic certified teacher. And she's also the professional development chair for the Connecticut Geographic Alliance. She's worked with many amazing programs, and you'll see that in her bio on the site. Um, she was appointed a, mem a board member for the CT Council for Social Studies, and she's even one of the authors of the Connecticut State Social Studies Framework. Now you see why I'm so excited about having her here with us today. She is actively involved with Mystic Seaport's Indian Heritage, and her students began to investigate some of these connections, and they actually partnered with a school in New Zealand. So con to continue that relationship and research other international connections to the sea, she was given a, a Fund for Teachers Fellowship and gets to travel to New Zealand in 2017. And she's even receiving a very special award, the Orion Award, for her work with Mystic Seaport for Educators. So welcome, Laura. Thank you so much for joining us today. And to get started, we'd love to have you answer our newbie question. And then you can move right into your presentation. So tell us, why do you think it's important for teachers to teach geography? And is it sufficient to teach it incidentally in other subject areas? Take it away. Thank you so much, Peggy. I hope you can hear me OK. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I love this question because, I, and in fact, we're going to explore that even more in the, in the presentation today. Because I think teachers find that it's either you do one or the other. But think about our classrooms. They're so diverse. And our students are arriving with a, wide, with a wider world view already. In addition, our kids are already connected. Think, this summer they were all doing Pokemon Go. So we can already tap into our globally minded students to foster global, global literacy. Um, I heard a wonderful quote from Fernando Weimer, who is with the Harvard School of Education. He said, if the purpose of education is to empower all students to be global citizens, 
we must elevate our aspirations of what it means to educate children well. Therefore, a geographic or a global perspective should be included in nearly everything we teach when we discuss the setting of a story, when we inspire kids to care about their environment, when we learn how to sing songs of various cultures, when we have a mystery Skype with a school across the street or around the world. Is it important to memorize all the provinces of China? Maybe and maybe not, especially when we have the tools to help us quickly find that information. But knowing that more people in the world speak Mandarin than any other language due to the population density demonstrates global literacy skills. Doing this with our students may mean a change in our mindset or a growth mindset of moving past coloring in maps to, you know, quote, cover geography, unquote, to making the learning of cultures and places meaningful and to see how globalization affects our own lives. And with that being said, I'm going to move into um, the session here. And this will all be available to you. And I can share the document again afterward as well. The theme is Global Literacy and Geography Resources Approaches in Inquiry. And to get us started, for those of you who are joining in, um, we are going to play a game. So if you have a device, I know you're on a computer right now. If you have, you can do this on your computer. If you have a phone, we're going to play a game on Kahoot.it. If you open up a browser, you should be able to see that. I'm going to switch gears here to show you what it should look like. And I hope you can see this. Peggy, can you see this? Yes, I can see that just great. And I'll type that in the chat, too. Perfect. And okay, I'm gonna they need to scroll screen. down. If they're doing it in the web browser, they just need to scroll down a little bit till they get to the place where it says to enter the PIN. Yes. And the PIN is uh, 846404. And while people are logging in to this, um, when the question comes up on the screen, there will be some choices that will appear. And their choices are color coded. So when you see it on your device, you'll see the colors and not necessarily the text that's on the screen. So you may have to look two places at once. So, And this won't be a hard quiz. But these are the type of questions that we ask. Of, these are fifth grade questions that students should know. So this is, if you're smarter than a fifth grader, then <laughs> hopefully we'll do OK with this. It's kind of a fun um, activity, but it's also text for understanding with your own students. So far, we have 13 people. I'll wait just another minute or so for everybody to get signed in. If you don't want to play along and you just want to watch, that's fine, too. <laughs> And I just realized somebody named themselves Lost Cause. I'm sure you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fine. OK, so we have 14 players, oh, 15. I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, we have 30 seconds on the question. But if everybody chooses an answer before the 30 seconds are up, the, the question closes, and we can see what the results are. OK, here we are. We're going to start. We won't do all nine questions. We'll just a few. What can you do with geography? Here's a question. How might you use this type of map in the classroom? Eleven of you recognize. I'm sorry about the music. I should have warned you. It's quite loud. <laughs> I think there's a way of turning that down. Um, but the eleven of you recognize that it shows historical change. Sometimes uh, these other factors may play in. So 
just because one may be obvious, there may be more than one answer. So let's take a look at the next one. We'll do one more. Oh, Mary T, you were the fastest, apparently. But lost cause, see, you were not a lost cause. You came in just under to her time. Top three within seconds of each other. Here's the next one. In this case, all the answers were correct. <laughs> Tricky one, huh? It goes to show that showing sometimes maps from a different perspective. And I don't know if anyone recognizes that that is a map of the night sky or seeing the Earth from space at night. So it's signs of all of those. You can see evidence of light pollution. You can see evidence of urbanization, desertification, and population dis distribution. So let's end that there. There are, oh, Susie. Knocked it out. She got them both <laughs> correct. <laughs> and you can see, just for your own purposes, those of you who have not used Kahoot before, you can use this. And we can see all the results. Thinking about it, final results, here they are. You could go through and check and see how your students did. You can even save the results and download them for uh, assessment purposes in your classroom. It's kind of a handy thing to be able to use in your classroom. And if we were together in person, I would offer prizes for those of you who are the top scorers. But I apologize, since we're doing this virtually, it's a little bit trickier to do. <laughs> so let me switch back to our presentation here. I think you can see our Kahoot now, yes? OK, good. All right. So thank you for doing that little icebreaker with us. I did find, I, I found that some students find that the music makes them more anxious and they feel very competitive. <laughs> so if it's more helpful next time, I might turn off the music on that. Um, and <coughs> Terry, I apologize for you seeing the, only the answers, um, the choices on the game. That's one of the things you have to kind of split your screen between what you see on the screen and, and what your teacher might be projecting. So. Um, I apologize if it was technical difficulties for some of you. Uh, but I'm going to move past the game for a second, because uh, one of the important things that we've been doing here in Connecticut, I live in northeast part of the United States. So for those of you who are coming in from around the world, um, we've been working really hard in trying to align the um, Connecticut social studies, what we teach in social studies, with the, na the new national standard. The standards for the national social studies came out in about 2013, and we, I think, were the first state to follow up with uh, a state version of that um, to connect to local resources. And our intent was to primarily focus on the dimensions of inquiry. And I was recently in a, um, a language arts classroom, an English cl classroom, and their dimensions of inquiry were slightly different. So if this looks different to you, um, I just wanted to point out what these strands are. These four dimensions um, go through students developing questions and the planning of inquiry. So instead of it being what you may have heard of using uh, an essential question to guide your curriculum, or if you've used the understanding um, by design, the UBD model, that uh, essential question is you know, ingrained in curriculum. But social studies is looking at switching from something that's just essential to something that's compelling, because compelling makes it um, it has more action or more passion driven behind it versus just something you have to know versus something you want to find out on your own. In addition to that, as part of social studies, the four main disciplinary concepts, um, history, geography, civics, and economics, a lot of people feel that they're not doing as much geography as they probably either are or they just don't know how to do it well. So hopefully we can give you some tools for that today. Dimension three is evaluating sources and using evidence. Now, this is a two-fold strand because not only do teachers have to evaluate the sources you use with your students, you think about all those reading levels and making sure the material is appropriate, 
but also students themselves evaluating a source as being a valid or invalid source, or even looking at types of historical maps as being um, sources and what kinds of information we can get from those. And the last model uh, dimension is dimension four, which is communicating conclusions and taking action. So this may or may not involve some type of civic action, but it involves some type of um, demonstrating your understanding of your learning and seeing if it can go beyond just what's happening in the classroom. And for the elementary teachers, I totally understand that it may be a challenge for you to incorporate geography. And I know you know you have to do it, but these are, these are the top three reasons I find that teachers say that it's hard for them to incorporate in the classroom. And if you feel like any of those three of these fit you, you are not alone. We know, with, in, especially in the United States, there's so much mandated testing that you feel like you have to just get through all the materials so the students have exposure. And you don't have time to add one more thing. I get that. Or if you do have time for it, you don't have a way of finding valid or, or useful sources or global literacies that fit to the topic that you're going to teach. Um, and that ties in with the second one. You don't have a way of doing it or you don't know where to find the materials. So as an example, and this may not suit your where your location is, but from our um, Connecticut State Social Studies Framework, I just went through and pulled one sample question, type of a compelling question, that could go for just the elementary grade level. These are the levels that most classrooms are integrated in that there's probably one teacher teaching all the subjects. Once you get into upper grades, of course, you may now start to separate and you may have a teacher who's just doing social studies or geography and you figure, well, that teacher is, is the one to do that. Um, that's not really true, but that's often the mindset. But for those of you doing elementary, I wanted to see, I wanted you to see the types of questions could be used um, to look at in the kindergarten uh, compelling question, first, second grade. And in third grade, in our state, um, our frameworks are really geared toward looking at Connecticut in the world and how it ties into, how Connecticut ties into American history. So that's why I put that little note that looking for the Connecticut connections here. Uh, and especially, I love the question for third grade because honestly, even in upper grade, you're probably asking that question. And it's probably for question three, why do we live where we live? There's either a geographic, an economic, or a family reason why we live where we live. Of course, our third graders, if you go have them ask, why do you live here? There's one of those three reasons. If you ask yourself, why do you live where you are? It's probably one of those reasons. It's geographic, economic, or it's a family reason. In Connecticut, we have a slight shift um, in grade four. We look really at geography, but we look at the regions of the United States, so the Northeast, Southeast, what makes up um, the geographic region of the country. And then in grade five, we start looking more at the people of the United States, and, and we only go through early American history in grade five. But of course, there's a, a ge geographic purpose in those as well. I have this framework that is put together by the, uh, the Global Competency um, Task Force. Um, and I thought this was fantastic because it shows here um, versions of our, our inquiry dimensions in the center. Um, dimensions one through three actually are the top part of the circle. And then the bottom two are the dimension four, the taking informed action and communicating conclusions is here. And I know it's a little bit hard to see on the side, um, these texts. But if this is a, an excellent example of ways you can do this in your own classroom. You know, identifying create and create opportunities for personal or collaborative action to improve conditions. So instead of having something that's happening just in your classroom, can't you have those, your students partner with the school somewhere else that may also be looking at similar solutions to problems, and then they can collaborate to find global ways of making those connections. Again, this is such a fantastic um, diagram, and it, and it does give practical um, suggestions on the side, in the side boxes of how you can use it. And it, it, it makes perfect sense, and sometimes you just need that little reminder to show you ways that you can connect to the world. 
in this next um, slide, I pulled together, since we are talking elementary for the most part, but this is, includes everyone, um, if you're looking for interdisciplinary types of inquiry questions, so this is not limited to the social, social studies room or to the geography room, but there are questions that we ask all the time that are geography focused. When we're talking about a story or a book, why did the author choose to use this setting? It's a geography question. There's the other question. How did you or your family come to live here? It's a geography question. What can you infer about images on, in maps? I think this particular question is super fascinating. We have um, locally, and also the Library of Congress has a fantastic digital map collection. And they'll take a city or a, an area over time, and they, call, they make what they call ma um, mashup maps. It's M-A-S-H. Uh, UP mashup maps where they digitally overlay one a historical map over another map through time, and so you can see a local city, and you can see what was what it was like a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, or for our friends visiting who are joining us from Belgium and Italy and Greece, you could go back hundreds of years to see how time changes and how our geographic understanding changes, how people have used the land, how it's changed how neighborhoods are called, or why neighborhoods are called what they are. It's probably based on somebody who lived in that area or region in earlier times, and we can find that information on maps. Um, just as a side point to that, there is an organization at the University of Connecticut called MAGIC, M-A-G-I-C, which is the Mapping and Geographic Information Center. They will collaborate with you to make a map up, a map mashup, excuse me, of an area or a region that you could use in the classroom. And they'll take the digital maps and, and do that work for you. So they're an amazing resource, and I would highly recommend you look them up. It's uh, UCon Just look up Yukon Magic, and it'll be your first link. Um, additional geographic questions. What resources would one need to live here? Now, I understand, Peggy, that you live in Arizona, and the, the resources in Arizona are quite a bit different than the resources in my part of the country. So you would need different resources to live in different places. And that would be an important thing for students to understand as well. The next columns are how did this language or religion or food or technology, you can fill in any blank, fill in the blank in that spot, come to be in this area. And when I say this, it can be anywhere that you're studying. It could be your area. It could be uh, another area in the world and have students just do that one question. How did this language come to be here? If you're learning about um, colonization, that may be a perfect example of, you know, tracing language. Why are why do these people speak French in these parts of the, in this part of the world? And it's a perfect example of how people move and bring their languages and cultures with them. The next two questions: Who has the right to control? I leave that question open because that is something you can as another fill in the blank. For example, you could put in water. You could put in resources. You could put in me. Those type of words that you put in there changes your geographic perspective. And the last one is how do we get our resources? Um, and depending on what the issues are that are going on in your area, those resources may be in different states of flux. And so that would be a good question for students to think about how do we get what we have? How do the groceries get to the store? How do we get a strawberry? How do we get a banana? There's actually some really excellent programs that are out there to help to reinforce that type of information. Um, and again, if we're trying to get students to look at the big picture of things, using your local resources are you should do first. Um, there are people right in your communities that will provide a, a lot of um, support for your classroom. We have, I, can, I mentioned the Yukon Magic here. In Connecticut, we have our Connecticut Geographic Alliance, but in every state in the United States, there is a geographic alliance. It's a network under the National Geographic, so um, there are a lot of resources that are available, and they'll come even to your school to provide that information. For those of you who are abroad, of course, National Geographic is, is online, and there's also other um, international geographic organizations that can also assist you for educational resources. We also worked on another thing more recently on Connecticut. It's called teachatct.org, which is looking for primary source 
excuse me, and secondary source documents um, within our communities that will help students to find um, answers to geographic questions and to other historical questions by using those sources. And one of the maps that we decided to feature was a map of our capital city, Hartford, um, that was made about 100, 200 years ago. And the information on that map it does help a lot with helping students to infer about our communities. Uh, the, and by the way, all the geographic alliances um, in, in mid-November, the third week in November, often do something called Geography Awareness Week. And I see, I think somebody, Susie, um, noted it here too. Um, Geography Awareness Week has a lot of resources that they can provide for you um, to help at least get kids interested in about the world. In addition, there's ways of making sister school partnerships um, so that you can find schools around the world who might be willing to partner with you on some of these um, topics, maybe the ones that related to the questions we had on the earlier slide. Um, if Twitter is an excellent tool. We found some amazing teachers and classrooms around the world who have partnered with us either through, directly through Twitter or um, that's how we got connected and then we continued through other sources. And I did make a note here, but for those of you who um, have students kindergarten through college in January, starting at the end of January through about the end of March, there is a program called Walk My World. It's a hashtag. So if you do hashtag Walk My World, um, every week there's another prompt that asks students or people around the world to respond to it. And then they can see the types of, of um, responses that come up from it. I'll give you an example. We had people that we had the view from our front door one year. That was a one week topic on Twitter. And so the people who participated in the students and their uh, teachers took a picture of the view from their door. So for some people, it was they had a, a wide yard. Some people had just a view of apartment across the hall from them. Um, some who didn't have a door that had a view, they took a picture of a view from their, a window or some opening in the house, and they just shared the image and then just said what they saw. It was, it was 140 characters, and it was very, very powerful because students got to understand the types of um, places where people lived and the, their views that they saw every day. In addition to that, um, there's things like ePals and an organization called iEarn, which I'll show in a few minutes that is also um, an excellent way of getting kids to uh, collaborate. There's also things like global, global broadcasting um, or sites like Periscope and Instagram where you can share the learning that kids are doing and then they can get feedback from others. In addition, looking toward our local museums for global interdependence and also how they have it, a, a, how where they are has an impact on history. And I did put this link here because as you heard, Peggy commented that I've been working with this museum on some educational projects. And I didn't really, I mean, I recognize that they're a seaport, of course, they go to sea, but I didn't really think about how people from our local community ended up moving to other places and sometimes even became part of communities around the world and their descendants are there and their local people from here that now are connected to a bigger global picture. If, and I found that out as an adult, so imagine how exciting that would be for your own students. So what does this look like? Let's take a look. On the left I have a picture. We have um, some students working on a map that we created in the classroom. These maps are all downloadable, and those of you who have used the National Geographic website probably recognize that is the, um, from the Maps Maker Kit. And those of you who are on the um, the live finder later, I do have a link to that. They have giant maps that you print them out at your printer at school on eight and a half by 11 paper. The kids can put the pages together using their geographic um, reasoning and then use them for different purposes. So for example, uh, if you're doing an interdisciplinary classroom and you're reading a book like Watson, Watson's Go to Birmingham, um, you could have a map of either the United States or they now have it broken down by state so you could have students map out the route that the family may have taken or you can make it a contest and have groups of students decide what the route would be and how much it would have cost to take different routes. How would you stay? Where would you stop? And since in Watson, when you go to Birmingham, it's a book about um, civil, civil rights. 
the family may not have been able to stop in any hotel. So that's another layer that you could have added to that investigation. Um, another option is, and for a literature option, is the book Long Walk to Water, which is set in Africa. And it talks about refugees, but it also talks about water resources. So as Salva in the story has to go from country to country, students could map out where he traveled using these maps. It also helps with regional studies. And so if you're looking at, um, we were learning about the Silk Road, and you could have a whole map of Asia and part of you know, Eastern Europe included in the map, and the students then could use that as part of their learning throughout either an entire year or an entire unit. They are quite large, I should warn you, the, the wall size maps can be as tall as 10 feet tall. They have smaller versions, though, a tabletop size map, which is, I think, nine, between six and nine sheets of paper. And of course, you could do individual maps, but you lose some detail the smaller the maps um, become. And then in addition on the right here, um, we have a picture of some students collaborating with a school in New Zealand. Um, and so there's a lot of ways you can do global collaboration through Edmodo. We did a global read of loud and used Edmodo as a platform for students to discuss the different themes in this global story. Um, and iEARN can also help students use um, the platform to do collaborative global projects. And then this one, we just use Google Hangouts. And we you had to find the right time because of the time zone differences. But we had the kids had already spoken online through a forum site. And then they had a chance to actually see each other you know, face to face or virtually face to face. It was a great experience. And we'll definitely be doing that one again. There's other options for this. This is just a few examples. There's a lot of ways of incorporating um, global connections in your class. I also wanted to point out um, Esri, which is, um, does a lot with uh, mapping, dig group, um, digital mapping, is working really hard to put together some interdisciplinary units by grade level and, and also by topic. So if you see down here on the left, they have some geo inquiries, which are, uh, for, so if you're teaching US history, you can find some examples of ways of using it in the classroom. But then if you go down, it's even by grade level. So this is a brand new geo inquiries for grade four, and it shows the connections between social studies and science and how geography is interdisciplinary. And this is a screenshot just of the, of the link here, but I believe that's already in the live binder. I just wanted to point that one out. OK, and then looking at the geography and inquiry theme again, and I know a lot of places are still um, trying to connect you know, what we've learned about the past with what we know uh, about about today. And so if we look at themes like if you're teaching about the Silk Road, if you're teaching ancient times, you talk about the Silk Road and how they now connect to major cities, how those cities that were made up or the stopping points along the different Silk Road routes um, became still our melting pots of different global collaborations and ideas. Uh, it ties to what we do now. And almost we could almost say that technology has become a new version of that Silk Road, that it's now a global melting pot. You can talk about in migration, immigration, water use, and resources. Themes like education, child labor, and um, social justice are also excellent topics to look at um, for geography and inquiry. Just as a side note to go with those, if you are familiar with the Girl Rising Project, there's a film called Girl Rising, which really looks at especially these themes because in oftentimes in some cultures, if there's education, uh, educational neglect, it's usually for the girls. And it's often because of these reasons or even these reasons, uh, water use, resources, child labor. Um, it's a very powerful um, project. Also, this topic on who owns history, I think, is a very good one that ties back to geography and inquiry. And it's becoming more um, prevalent in the news now, too. Uh, for a few examples, um, you may be familiar with the Elgin marbles. Those are the carvings that came off of the Parthenon in Greece. And the Elgin marbles are in, on display in London. So that would be a good question for students to think about, well, why are they in London if they're supposed to be on a Greek building? Of course, there's a reason for it. But students wonder then who owns, who should own that history? Or conversely, the Nefertiti bust from Egypt is on display in Berlin, and right now it's being, well, it was being contested. Um, I think it still is. It's just with the political unrest in Egypt. I don't know if it's still being pursued right this moment, but 
such a good question for students to think about. But another good example is also the, also some of the artifacts from Iraq that are in London, which actually preserved them because of the civil unrest and the unrest that was happening in Iraq. Many of the artifacts were damaged or destroyed in their museum there, but the ones that were in London, of course, are still preserved. So sometimes it's safer to have artifacts out of the country. So that's a really good question about history and how it connects to geography. Um, I also included this, I know this link doesn't work, but I do include this link in the live binder. One of the questions that came up that we were discussing with working with the Mystic Seaport, we turned it into a question focus. And for those of you familiar with the right question um, technique, we have we present a statement to students and have them develop questions based on the statement. So in our statement our, was our, how culture affects how we view whales. And nowadays we don't do whaling in, in the United States for the purpose of getting it as a whale blubber for energy. But there are still some cultures who do do whaling and others who use whaling as a tourist thing, take boats out for whale watches and so forth. And this link here is an excellent um, example of a student, she's a high school student, I believe, who argued that in some cultures they have to do whaling for, for um, sustenance. And I thought it was a very good example of, because a lot of people say that, you know, whaling is horrible, but depending on your culture, that may not be the case. And she argued it very well and gave very concrete examples. And I thought, what a great example of that dimension for, you know, communicating a conclusion and taking informed action. It's a perfect example. And with that thought, t taking informed action, um, these are some examples of our students just in the, in the last school year who, after they read Long Walk to Water and they had learned about um, issues of water and, and education and access and, and pollution to, uh, to water, they decided to have a give back day and the kids were doing all kinds of things to help um, drive awareness of different global issues. And as you can see this one, they were making, taking, um, getting tips for water for South Sudan. They were trying to um, help build a well and they were using the money to send to uh, an organization that drills wells in, uh, in Africa. And of course this young boy on the right here was looking more at water pollution and how uh, rivers are being uh, diverted and polluted and so that sometimes uh, rivers aren't even making them, making them to themselves to the sea any longer because of the overuse of rivers. Um, so I thought it was such a powerful day and the students really were driven to come up with their projects and their inquiries on this and it was really worth sharing with you. So I'm going to switch now, switch gears and just share a few resources with you in um, the live binder that we put together and Peggy mentioned it earlier and so did Lori that we have a, a live binder link to my binder within the Classroom 2.0 binder. So I'm going to switch over to my um, desktop so you can see. I'm going to go off to Kahoot. Okay, so uh, this is the link directly to my binder and of course the link that they just gave you will have this as one of the links inside of it. And I wanted just to point out a few things. As you notice on the left side, if you've never used a live binder before, on the left side these are like the tabs you would have in uh, an actual binder. And if you click on a tab, it would open up the pages that you would put between them. So just as a placeholder, I put our Connecticut frameworks on the top. This may or may not apply to you, but I put them there because that's one that I use quite frequently. So I leave that there. But if you're following along on the left, if you go down to where it says resource links, that's about the fifth one down, and you click on this, all of these gray tabs underneath here are additional pages. And I have a lot. I apologize, but I'll be honest with you, I use them all the time. And if I can't remember where something is and I remember a topic, I'll go to my live binder and, and then find the link that way. But I wanted to point out just a few on here as we go along. As you first hit classroom links, this opens up to museum. Uh, museum is a, actually a news museum in the United States in Washington, D.C. But they have an amazing collection of newspapers and every day they have something called Today's Front Pages. And so as we scroll down here, you'll see it says today's front pages. They take the front page of newspapers from all around the world and put them, make them linkable to this page. So for today, and every day this changes, today we have 763 newspapers featured on the site. 
So you could go down and ask students, maybe there's a newsworthy event, or what just have them find out what is the main news story going on today in, in this newspaper. And to make this a little bit more interactive, if you notice here, you can sort by region. You can choose if you want to have students look in different parts of the world. And this is newly added. There's a new map feature. So you can have them click on the map. I'm going to, have to scroll this up a bit. And all the pins of the newspapers, woo, hold on. The newspapers that are being featured today will show up. And then right now it says USA, but we can make it all. Oh, I'm going to refresh again. Make it all. So you can see here are all the newspapers today that are being featured. So students could literally go and pick one, pin on it, and it will open up to the day that newspaper in that location. And they could find out what the news story is. And then you could ask them what shows, what's important in the news in that place today. And it could be if there's something very newsworthy, it could be a similar headline around the world. Or looking at points of view and perspective, this is an ex excellent example of using different newspapers. And by the way, if you're looking, they have a top 10, but they have an archive as well. So some newsworthy events that happened in the past, like September 11th um, for here in the United States. But as you go down, some bigger, um, Here's some bigger world events. You can see like um, what was happening, through, how the news was being reported about a specific event anywhere in the world on that particular date. It's an amazing resource. So anyway, that's museum in today's front pages. There's a lot to do there. OK, now I'm going to shift back over on the sidebar here to our, our resource links. And I, there's a lot here, but there's also one on this Curriculum 21 I want to point out really just really briefly, Curriculum 21 is um, a clearinghouse. It's mapping the global classroom of the future. This is by Heidi Hayes Jacobs, um, who is a really big proponent of global literacy. Uh, she wrote the book Mastering Global Literacy, which I use as a textbook with my um, college students, my sixth year graduate students. But what this um, Curriculum 21 site has on the clearinghouse, if you're looking for global topics, if you click on all resources, look how many topics come up. It is amazing. If you're looking for global, global education, global partnerships, you could click on that, and then it will break it down into specific resources and links for you. I know I did that very quickly because I've, I know the site, but honestly, there is a lot of resources here. And she has, um, and there's other people, also uh, people at Curriculum 21, too, who help to curate this. But um, it's an amazing, ex excellent resource, and they're changing it all the time. So I just wanted to make sure it just, it doesn't look like much over here on the left, but it actually there's quite a bit once you go inside. There's here's the, by the way, if you want to make your own Kahoot, the one that we did earlier, you can find that there. As well as here's some of the Library of Congress map collections, the digital collections. In addition to that, if you want to connect the map collection to their um, regular collections, they have that beneath it. Um, it has a, a way of making infographics for students. Oh, here's the Yukon Magic. Um, site. Um, you can click on there and that gives you information um, about how to make those maps as well. Um, I'm going to jump up here to student news. It says student news, but it's actually from taking it global. And for those of you who are um, working with your students to help them get through that dimension four, the taking informed action, and um, this provides support for student research super helpful. Um, then this way you don't have to have all the information. Your students can do their research on their own. I did earlier mention over here on the left is iEarn.org. And I don't know if, um, if Peggy, you've mentioned this site before, but um, iEarn has uh, an excellent platform here for allowing students to collaborate with each other. And if you go down here and you browse their projects, um, they have, this is just a, a landing page. Depending on the language your students speak, you could choose. I'll just choose English. And say the subject is, hey, we'll do geography. And we search. It's going to give you all different types of projects that are ongoing that students, your students can join with other students in. And it's also nice because it gives you the age range. So you could choose which grade level um, you also wanted to do. So if you're really an elementary you know, you know, younger elementary teachers, you, you may find some of these are a little bit advanced. So you can change the category um, for that. But 
I've been using iron for years, and it's it's really exciting for kids to be able to say, oh, I heard from somebody in, in such a country or this country, and he has the same type of, you know, sneakers that I have. It was It's very cool for the kids to make those leaps. Um, I'm not going to take the time now because there's others on here, but there's a Connect All Schools uh, tab here on the left, and the Asia Society, which has quite a bit of information. This um, Newspapers and Education, the Geography Connections, these are deliberately written for middle grades, and they are done in PDF. So all these countries are posted on here, or they will be posted, and there's an archive on the side of different um, one-page informational articles about these um, geographic locations. Look at them all. And we worked with the Hartford Current here in Connecticut to have these printed so that students had a, a global, um, basically, basically a database of information. Um, the last one I'm going to point out on this page is the Facing the Future. If you have not used Facing the Future, this looks at some um, issues that, are, um, that students will have to consider as they grow up, um, and they have resources for teachers. So here's, for example, engaging students through global issues is, a, is an excellent teacher source. It has handouts for students, but it also has materials for you as a teacher. Just briefly, this global population section has a very good website called 100 People, um, and it's like a portrait of what 100 people in the world would be. Um, also, this world of 7 billion, they have a video contest so that students can look at issues that's facing, facing the global population, and they can make a 60-second PSA or public service announcement video about the issue and solutions for fixing those problems. It's excellent. It, and our students, I think, are going to participate in that again this year. I do have a, a couple of links. The National Geographic link has the uh, links to the interactive and the map maker kit so you don't have to go searching for them. The map maker kit does not appear to be loading, but if you click on these, it will open in another tab. So we won't take the time to look at that right now. And just for your own benefit, um, sometimes you may be looking for more professional development in these areas. I have a tab called professional learning, which has um, some other organizations that can provide sources for you as a teacher of how to bring a global perspective into your classroom. And also, beneath professional learning, I have, you know, I'm opening and closing these rather quickly, global education. Uh, there's, this is an excellent survey to have the kids try. Another link, I put iron again because it seems like a place that was a good spot for it, but also Flat Connections, which is based out of Australia. They have some um, excellent resources there. And Lastly, I'm going to point out in the binder what is this? the Global Oneness Project down here. Oh, here's that video about the whales, by the way. Um, but the Global Oneness Project um, has a topic about climate change. Um, and Global Oneness has a, a, they put things out pretty regularly on Twitter. So if you follow them on Twitter, you'll see when they have a new, let me just click on this. Um, you'll see when they have a new topic that comes up and they have different leveled uh, resources for students. So you see if it has an, a little folder like this, it's an article or a film, something students can watch and then respond to. It's excellent for migration, culture, nature, a um, lot of different topics and lesson plans for teachers. So I just wanted to make sure you had a chance to see that because I think it's a really powerful, useful um, tool. So the, all these links, and again, inside of each one of these has other additional pages. So it's quite, there's quite a bit there. Um, and, and I hope you have a chance to explore what's in there. I'm going to switch back. A few I didn't feature, uh, the Mystic Seaport Museum has, a, we've been working really hard on the digital collection there. And I think you will find that there's a lot, of, we're still working on getting the resources in. Um, so please you know, bookmark them. And I have them also in the binder. I also didn't point out Teach UNICEF, um, but they have quite a few materials that are leveled. So if you go onto the Teach UNICEF site and you're looking at something like health, you, there's an elementary section, a middle school section, and a high school section, so you can find materials that will be appropriate for your own grade levels of students. And of course, our geographic alliance is here, and everyone, every state in the United States has one. So please reuse them. They're an excellent resource for you.
and I think, I know I went rather quickly there toward the end, but if there are any questions that I have missed because when I switched screens I couldn't see them, if there's a question that you have that I've missed, please post them on the chat and I will follow up with you um, afterwards. So thank you so much for having me today. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. I did capture a couple questions, Laura, uh, as, as we went along. Great. I'll switch for um, you here. Okay. Are there other open source global databases similar to Gapminder? Oh, Gapminder is excellent. You're right. Yes, there are some. I'm trying to, I, I think in the binder under the National Geographic has one. They have a mm -hmm. new um, interactive map. It's, um, uh, it has very similar parameters to Gapminder. So you can put them in. However, they just changed their interface. And I found that I was having a learning curve on the interface that I was trying to navigate through. So um, I do know it has the capability. I just haven't tested it. So mm -hmm. um, it's called the intera Interactive. Well, I'm going to have to switch back and double check. Um, there is that one. And I think Esri has one as well. Mm -hmm. Um, let me just quickly look while we have it here. I think it's called, yes, yeah, the interactive map on, or yeah, interactive map on National Geographic. I think that that one has similar, it, I don't know if it plops out like, uh, plots out like map, uh, Gapminder, but I, mm -hmm. it used to. <laughs> so see if that helps and see if you can try the one on Esri. Okay. Is it useful to incorporate geography skills into other subjects or assignments? Of course, yes. Please do that whenever possible. I think students don't realize that they're learning geographic skills when we do mm -hmm. that. And yet, mm -hmm. when we ask them to do things like tell us about the setting of a story or, um, you know, how did we get, why did the, why did we get this you know, resource here. Why do we live in this area? Those are all geographic questions. Um, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, we can do that in every grade level and we can do it in every subject. And sometimes using incorrect geographic um, expression was helpful too for then students then can transfer that understanding from one subject to another. With Google Earth evolving as the technology advances, what would be recommended as a good up-to-date resource to learn how to get the most out of Google Earth in the classroom? I am so glad you brought You know, I didn't include Google Earth in any of this. It was almost intentional, no. <laughs> but I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, it's not, I love Google Earth. I am certified in Google Earth and Google Maps. However, mm -hmm. what I'm finding, and this may be the case of some of you in your schools as well, that Google Earth, um, especially uses up so much bandwidth that mm -hmm. the schools are blocking it from the schools because it or it, because it slows down the whole network. So we're not even yeah. using we're using Google Earth any longer in our schools. Even Google Maps sometimes kids get frustrated sometimes with using it, even though it's an amazing tool. You can we did this. We actually made um, the was a flyover map where you can mm -hmm. go from po point to point. And we had our different schools um, plotted out for what the schools that we had communicated with on this Google Earth map. And you could do the flyover from place to place. We had a student then who went on a trip to India and Nepal. Mm -hmm. And he used those skills that we used for making this big classroom collaborative map. He made his own flyover map to all the places that he mm -hmm. visited on his trip. And wow. then he dropped in his own pictures into mm -hmm. his tour so that he could then talk about where he went in it. And I was so proud of him because he had used something we had done to make it an actual product that he could then share about his, his right. trip. Um, and then he had, of course, all the Google features that go along with that. So he knew the you know, elevation and how high he was up in, in the Himalayas. And it was amazing. So yes, if you, can, if you can find a way of using it in the classroom, great. But just know that um, if you're having bandwidth issues, issues it's not your fault. It's just the mm -hmm. network. The network can't support that much data that's being generated on the Google products. Mm -hmm. Some, uh, Peggy posted that, uh, or somebody posted about Google Trex being less bandwidth hungry than Google Earth. Um, 
Google Maps and Google yeah. Tricks that are far far less than Google Earth. Yeah, you know, as far as bandwidth That's goes. That's true. You're correct. That is true. Um, but we still, in our at least in our district, we still had trouble with maps. Um, Mm -hmm. And even the other thing is a little disturbing is when you go into cities, it, it's supposed to some in some cities it, it will 3D them so you can do street level and you can go up yeah. um, and it looks like the cities are melting because the data loads are slowly. So, oh yeah, because how it comes into the, yeah. the screen. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. so if you have a lot of students on the devices at once, it, it gets frustrating for them. But yes, you're correct. It is less than Earth for sure. Um, but mm -hmm. if you can use it, that would be fantastic. Test it out first and test it with a group of kids in the room <laughs> or just model it. Yeah. Or just mo have a student model it, you know, project it up onto a screen so that you, everybody can see it instead of everybody using it at the same time. Sure. Those were the, the questions that I was able to capture during your presentation. I don't know if anybody has any others. If you could type in the chat, I can ask Laura. I see one person typing. Mm -hmm. oh, what do you think of those virtual tours using Google Glasses? I have not used Google Glasses, but I think it's a similar um, principle as the Google Maps where they can do the tour and you can make that mm -hmm. the students can make their own tour. Am I correct in understanding that? I wish I had the Google Glasses. That'd be way cool. But I think their technology is similar. Yeah, I'm not sure. Ben, ben typed yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing that our student um, had done. He did the uh, he made a map tour of his journey around Nepal and India. Um, so mm -hmm. it, there is value in doing it, yes. Absolutely. And if you can do it, oh, the cardboard? I see somebody's coming up saying about the cardboard. Yeah, I am obsessed with the cardboard. However, they're super uncomfortable. So if anybody has, <laughs> it, they're not much more, but you can buy the virtual, um, the VR headsets that are plastic mm -hmm. with the head, headband on it um, so that a student can actually like rest it on their head without leaving the mark across their face. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, if you can get kids excited using those, that's fantastic gives them a real 3D view of what they would see. However, have them sit down and do it or sit on a rolly chair <laughs> because from experience you have kids standing up and they're like half falling down because they want to see everything and you have to physically right. turn your whole body around. But if you have them sitting on a rolling chair or something that swivels, that would be a lot easier and safer. Mm -hmm. Okay, that looks like the end of the questions. Thanks so much, Laura. I think everybody learned a lot today. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy. <laughs> oh, wow, Laura. That was fabulous. And there's no way you could fit all of that in in an hour, but thank goodness you have that wonderful live binder so we can really go exploring on our own and really check out some of those specific sites that you mentioned. Well, thank you all for joining us, and we hope you'll come back next week where we're going to have a fantastic presentation by Mike Murata on assistive technology for struggling readers. And it's good for struggling readers of all ages and with all, any kind of need. If they are struggling, this technology is going to help them. And on October 1st, we have another great session on iPads. Karen Lernman and Kristen Wydeen are going to talk to us about all kinds of ways you can innovate with iPads. So we hope you'll join us for that. And Lori, go ahead and wrap things up for us. All right. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his resources together in one place including host your own webinar where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room. And as long as your session is public, it's free. As you exit the session, the survey should open in your browser. If it doesn't, well, here's the direct link Peggy will post in the chat. Uh, it'll be in the, the chat 
box or in the log if you are um, accessing chat that way. The survey is also in the live binder, in the monthly live binder for Classroom 2.0 Live. At the bottom of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. It will print with your name, thanks to Patty Ruffing. Um, and here's the direct link for the survey. Special thanks to Laura Kronecki, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.